chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> there we're going to begin at verse 1, and we're going to read down through, uh, through them all. So that's about down to verse 11. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, down to verse 11. It says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. Let's pray. Our Father, again, <clears throat> Lord, I want to express uh, my thankfulness that you have allowed me, you've allowed us to be a part of your kingdom. And Father, I'm asking this morning that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth, well, right here in Oxford, in this church, well, in our hearts this morning in the same way that it is in heaven. Father, we've, we've come in from our many backgrounds and the many things that we do throughout the week. And, and Father, there's, there's been a lot of distractions on us throughout the week. There's been a lot of things that perhaps have troubled us. And may, Father, maybe even this morning there's things that have plagued us. And, and Father, that have tried to, to tear us away from our time of worship or ministry of the word. And Father, I'm asking this morning in Jesus' name that you would let nothing influence what you desire to do, what you desire to say, and how you desire to do it all. Uh, Father, we commit this time into your hands in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bind out the kingdom of darkness and all of its influence, and we loose into this place, we loose into our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to your authority and we loose within us the kingdom of heaven in all of its vastness, the power of your presence. Holy Spirit, you have promised to be here. You've said that where two or three are gathered together that you are there in the midst of them. And Holy Spirit, we recognize your presence here and we're asking in Jesus' name that nothing would stand in the way within us of you doing what you desire. Because we have come to meet with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't let us be disappointed in this, Father. Lord, we need you. We've been singing about this. We are desperate for you. Father, we're desperate for you that, that you might have more control in our lives. We're desperate for you that, that Lord, that the, that the struggles of the flesh, that these things would be overwhelmed in the glory of your presence. And Father, we would be delivered and set free from addictions and problems and difficulties and, and, and the things, Lord, that hinder our walk with you. And Father, that we would be victorious in the marching of the kingdom of God on the earth today. Father, you know our hearts. Father, I, I want to I wanna thank you, Lord, for, for Ken here this morning. And, and Father, for the major path, the, the major valley that he has walked through, he and Ruth together. And Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit would continue to bless him, heal him, strengthen him. Lord, just accelerate this in and around him in the name, 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Just bless them this morning, Father, with peace and with glory from your throne in Jesus' name. Father, I want to pray for all of those who are in the hospital today. And, and Father, you know who they are, whether they're in Amherst or whether they're in Truro, or Father, or whether they're in, uh, in Halifax or Moncton. Uh, Father, for surgeries or replacements or things coming or going, both ways, in and out of their bodies. And Father, I pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit would bless them and surround them with, with strength for healing, with blessing and encouragement and peace as they walk through these times. And Father, I pray, Lord, for those who aren't with us today for reasons of travel or work or, or whatever it might be. Maybe they're just at home having their coffee while they live, watch this on live stream. Father, I'm asking, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would touch them and bless them right where they sit by their kitchen table this morning. Father, we've come to meet with you. And so, Father, guide us in these things. Lord, I want to pray, and I'm asking very sincerely, and you know my heart, but Father, I'm asking very sincerely that you would clothe yourself with this form once again today. You would guide and guard the words of this mouth. Lord, we are not so interested to hear human wisdom or eclectic thought. But Father, we want to know what your spirit has to say to the church today. And so Father, I commit myself into your hands. I submit myself to your authority. Lead us according to your truth. Father, bless each one with open hearts and open minds and open eyes to receive all that you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> A lot going on this week. Um, Paula had mentioned, Pastor Paula had mentioned this morning that um, family camp starts, right? Starts Monday night, Monday night. Monday night with a concert, and uh, hopefully you can come for that. It's going to be a good time. Garfield, I'm talking to you. Gary, I'm talking to you right there. Talk to you both right now. <clears throat> it's going to be a good time, good concert, good spirit, and uh, so plan to come for that. And then all week, uh, the national director, Ian Fitzpatrick, is going to be speaking, and uh, you won't want to miss that. He's, uh, he's a great guy for an Irishman. He's a great guy, <laughs> you know, and uh, good sense of humor. You'll really enjoy him. So plan to come out for that, and we got lots of neat things happening throughout the week. And I think, is there a schedule at the back there of the family camp activities? You know, yeah. There's lots of things happening in the afternoons. Right, Marty? All kinds of stuff. You're in charge. What do you mean? Come on now. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be a good time. So plan to come out for that. Well, listen, in your Bibles there, we read this passage from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> and uh, you remember a couple weeks ago, we started this, and we did the first temptation, and, um, and it was kind of uh, under, under the title, something like uh, walking in authority, under the authority of God, versus walking under the principles of the devil. Now, you say, well, how do you, you know, as we're, we're Christians, okay, now let's, let's get this right. We're not walking under the principles of the devil. Well, that's, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. So we're going to do a little tune-up here, a little checkup on the car. We're going to change some oil maybe and some, adjust some spark plugs, get this machine running. In verse 1, it says, then. Then. Remember we talked about that, then. The then it's, it's speaking about are some of the high points in Jesus' life personally. I, I think they'd be high points. The high points in our lives, right? I mean, we, when you're baptized, you get a little certificate sometimes. And it says that, that Walter Davison was baptized at Big Lake Camp and he was 12 years old and, and this, this is the proof of it, you know? And, and we say, well, you know, I was baptized at such and such a time and this is my proof right here. I've got it. This is a high point in my life. I was saved when I was uh, six years old and I was baptized when I was 12 years old and I, and I followed through. These are the, some of the high points of our life. And they should be because that's an, that's an important event. I'm not downgrading that. But, but that's what then is referring to, where it says, then he was led by the Spirit. So then was when he was led by the Spirit after something else happened, after he was baptized, after the Holy Spirit came down, settled on him like a dove, after he had talked to John, after they had the discussion where John said, you know, you're the one that needs to baptize me. And Jesus said, well, no, we need to fulfill all this. After that, then this happened. So after the high point of Jesus' life, something powerful began to happen. This is important. Then he was led by the Spirit 
into his first church. Doesn't say that. You'd think that after the high point of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the water, after all this, then he was led by the Spirit to begin to save the world, right? You would think, that's what I would, after he, he had been on the mountaintop with, uh, with, with the Holy Spirit, after this great experience, then this great thing should have begun. Well, after this, he was led by the Spirit into the desert, <clears throat> you know, desert is a dry place, right? Now, I think it's sandy too. I don't know. It's sandy. I think desert. I think sand. I think, I think uh, uh, nasty little critters like snakes and lizards and all kinds of scorpions. I think, uh, I think not too many palm trees. I think not a whole lot of grass. I think, I think it's just a, a really barren, dry place. So then it, it strikes me that after... The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, listen to this, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Jesus went into a dry place. But he was led there by the Spirit. Well, wait a minute, the Spirit doesn't lead us into dry places. Okay, maybe he does. And he led him there to be tempted by the devil. Why would that ever happen? And then, it, you know, it gets worse. Verse 2 says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, the writer here states the obvious. He was hungry. He was hungry. He doesn't say he was blessed. Oh, he was on fire. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was charged up. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was ready to win the world. After 40 days and 40 nights, prayers were being answered all over the world and people were getting saved. It says he was hungry. He was... And then the tempter came to him. And he said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it's written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But well, we, we, we talked about that one. So I, I want us to look at the second one. It says, verse 5 there, this is the, kind of the one I want to, to deal with this morning. It says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And there he said this. He said, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down because it's written or for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against even a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. <clears throat> this, uh, you, you ever find sometimes the devil just picks at you? Am I the only one that happens to? Now, this means yes. This means no. Joseph, this means you're sleeping. Come on now. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm picking on you. Sorry about that. Shouldn't do that. But do you ever find that sometimes the devil just kind of picks at you? You know, just, he's just kind of there and he's picking. You know, you, you've got your resources up and you've got your strength up. You've got your shields up and you got your, your prayed up. But he's just kind of there picking. You know, and, and you know it's him and you know how he's picking and you kind of say, you know, just get away from me. You know, I, I don't want to be dealing with this. And, and it, it can be anything, it can be anything like, like what the Bible talks maybe about our besetting sins. Things that are you most easily tempted by. You know what I'm saying. He's picking at you. He's trying to discourage you. He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to, to get you to stumble. He's trying to get you to, to, to take on guilt. He's trying to get you to take on shame. You, you know what I'm talking about. Here, this, this, see, see, what makes this so interesting to me is this helps us to know our enemy and how he operates and what his principles of operation are. And so it also helps us to know how you can deal with that. So, so notice in, in the first one, in the first temptation, the devil, it says, uh, it says, verse three, it says, the tempter came to him and he said, if you are the son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. That's, a, that's the first shot across the bow of this little ship. 
If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus responds by saying, it is written. In other words, Jesus laid down the battle lines and he said, he said, Satan tempted him. He said, you know what? If God has said this, if God loves you, if you are who you say you are, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower, if God is powerful, if God can heal you, if God loves you, you know, and the list goes on and on. If, and he calls into question all the attributes of God and your relationship to him. And you will respond with the scripture. It is written, thou shalt, you know, not whatever it says, man shall not live by bread alone, you know, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So then the second temptation comes around, and you notice what the devil does this time. Um, as it comes down here in verse five, the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. You see, he followed what Jesus did. Did you notice that? He began to quote the scripture. He said, okay, I understand that you passed, you stepped up on the first step. The first temptation that the enemy uses is always to call into question your relationship with him. Make no mistake about it. That's what he does. And you, you, know, that, you know this. You know, uh, uh, think about when you were first in a relationship with God. He saved you. Maybe it was at an altar like this, and, and you, were, you were here, you, they were singing, you know, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee. And you came. Someone prayed with you. You said, Lord, I'm going to lay it all on the altar here today, and you did, and, and he saved you, and something happened inside you, and, and you knew that God did something. Then the enemy comes by. Do you really think God can love you? Maybe Maybe you think, maybe you think he does, but I know what you've done. Now, I'm not the only one that's ever thought that, so don't be looking at me like that. You know, this is what God does. You know it and I know it. I mean, this is what the devil does. You know it and I know it. He comes by and he, and he calls into question your relationship with God. Now, how you respond to that will, will determine what will happen next. Right? And you can respond to that and you say, you know what? No, sir. The God, God does love me. No, sir, I'm going to tell you what right now. And you begin to, strip, to quote the, the Bible. It says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I believe in Jesus Christ. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I believe the blood was shed for me. I, I'll tell you something right now. Here's, here's the thing. The devil will want to bring shame to you in your relationship with God, right? And he'll bring up stuff from your past, from your unredeemed past. And he'll bring up stuff and he'll say, you know what? God can't love you because you lied, you cheated, you blah, 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 blah. And then here, here's what you do, because this is really cool, because what, what will happen? This is what you do, is, is you say, you know what? That's right. I did all that, but God saved me anyway. God's blood is sufficient to cleanse me anyway. I'm going to praise God right now. Thanks for reminding me what God did. And then you see if that ever happens again in your life. Because the devil hates when you start praising God. And if what he's reminding you of in your past and that, that God has gotten rid of it and dealt with it, you start praising God for, for what Jesus did on the cross for you. Yes, I did that. I own that. But God saved me from it. I'm telling you. He can't stand that. He's not going to bring that up anymore. <clears throat> so then you move on to the next step. The next step is verse 2. I know I'm talking too much about verse 1, but anyway, forgive me. Verse 2 says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And then he begins to quote scripture. <clears throat> right? So in your first one, you know, you, you, uh, you, you, deal, you use scripture for your strength to overcome the principles of the devil. And then as you do that, you're submitting yourself to the authority of God because, because God's authority speaks through the scriptures, right? Did you hear that? God's authority speaks through the scriptures. So when you use the scriptures as a basis of your faith through Jesus Christ and his blood, God's authority then manifests in your life. So, so then now the devil comes along. This is, this is, this is really interesting and I only got 45 minutes left, so hang on here. You know, this is really interesting here. 
He says, uh, says, so if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it's written. You know, I'm gonna quote some scripture. He says, he says, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Doesn't God's word say that? Doesn't God's word say that? And so if God's word says that, you can jump off this cliff, you can jump off this temple, you can jump off this, and he's gotta save you, or maybe he just doesn't love you. See, that's kind of what he's saying here. Anybody know where the scripture comes from that the devil quoted? Bev, you gotta know. You know everything. Psalm 91. You got it, that's right. See, I told you you knew everything. You got Google wide open there. <laughs> Psalm 91. But you know what? That's verse 11 and 12. But if you, if you take the verses before that. See, here's the other thing I want you to notice about the principles of the devil. When you're dealing with him, he doesn't quote all the scripture. He quotes only those things that he can twist for his benefit. Here's, here's what it says. Verse 9 of Psalm, 20, of Psalm 91. If you, if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that they, you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent because he loves me, verse 14 says, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That's the full one. But you see, it begins in verse nine, if. If you make the most high your dwelling. Right, and see, now that what, <clears throat> let's, let's think about this. If you make the most high your dwelling. Let me think, let me think, let me think. If you make the most high your dwelling. <clears throat> if someone comes to your house and you say right away, you know, you're welcome. Come into my house. You know, I, I, I want you to, to enjoy the safety and the protection and the benefits and the fullness of my home. I, I, I just, you know, you are wounded, you're weary. I just want you to come in and I want you to know the benefits of my home. And they say, wow, I like this. Your house, you've got all kinds of, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of milk and honey together, but you got all kinds of milk and honey in your house. You know, you got all kinds of, a little lactose intolerant, you see, I can't really take so much of the milk. But you know, you've got all kinds of this and, and you've got enough food and you've got shelter. You've got heat in the wintertime. You've got all kinds of wood. I love a wood fire. Homemade bread. Carol, you listening over there? Homemade bread. It's great. Lemon pie, raisin pie. I'm right up on that. You've got all that. All these benefits. Wow. But you don't expect me to obey your rules, do you? You know, I, I want to stay out at, late at night with my friends, go to the bars. I'm just picking on that, you know, do whatever you want. I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I wanna live this style of life and I wanna go this place and, and you say, well, you know, wait a minute, you're living under my roof and I wanna give you benefits of that. Um, shouldn't, you know, you'd be a little respectful to me? Shouldn't you... You know, I'm not demanding a whole lot. I'm give, I'll give you life. I'll give you clothes to where Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Lilies in the field, you know, you want to dress as beautiful as them. You want to smell as beautiful as a lily. I love lilies. You know, you want to, you, you know, the, you notice the birds of the air, they don't toil yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you? But you don't want to respect me? See, he says here, he says, if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord your refuge, who, even the Lord who is my refuge, then this will happen. That, 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 that. But see, but the devil left that out. He didn't give you all the story. He didn't say to Jesus, he said, the Bible does say this. God's gonna protect you, and if he really loved you, he would. 
It wouldn't matter that you disobeyed him when he said, don't go down that road. When you turned around that corner, great big cliff there because the bridge was out, you didn't pay attention to the sign. It doesn't matter. If he loved you, he should have protected you. Well, you didn't pay attention to what he was saying. What does that even mean? <clears throat> you know, I haven't even started my sermon yet. You know, isn't it something? Uh, we're in for a blessing today, aren't we? So Matthew chapter 4. So the enemy, one of the principles of the operation of the enemy is to twist scripture just a little bit. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And, and Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, I, wanna, I do want to just touch on something and draw your attention because this, this was really cool as well. Um, verse 5, notice, the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Now, I would have thought <clears throat> that um, it might have been more spectacular to test your faith on the highest cliff of a mountain. Uh, and I don't know Jerusalem's on a mountain. But, uh, but I mean a rocky mountain. I mean, you know, why didn't he lift them way up into the air and said, okay, now if you're really, the, you know, God, if you're really son of God, I'm going to drop you. We'll see what happens. Why did he take him to, first of all, it says, and he didn't say Jerusalem, at least here. I mean, it says he took him to the holy city. And then at the holy city, which was holy, at the place where God's people gather, at the place of great religious experience, at the place where God wants to inhabit the holy city, he took him to the highest point in the holy city, the top of the temple. And and it says, it, it highlights this again. It says, and the highest point of the temple. I've thought um, on a number of occasions, why do pastors fail? Maybe, maybe, maybe this is a touchy subject. Maybe I shouldn't talk about this. I'm going to talk about it anyway. I'm a pastor. I can talk about, talk about myself, right? I'm talking about us. Because if pastors fail, anybody can fail. I'm not, you know, you know what I'm saying? So how does this happen? Let's, let's, we're, just, we're just talking, right? Just us. We're family. How does this happen? I, I wonder to myself sometimes if, if the devil doesn't have a hand in this. Well, of course he does because God doesn't want pastors or anyone to fail. And I wonder if sometimes if, uh, <clears throat> if the devil in the points of temptation doesn't begin to move through people's lives and accelerate their growth in a selfish kind of a way. You know, maybe, maybe we're called into ministry. And I can say this because I, I, I know what this feels like. You know, we're called into ministry. I know what it means to be called into ministry. And we're called into ministry. And, and yet then the devil kind of structures things because he knows, you know, I got to guard this little bit of selfishness inside this person. You know, or, or maybe you're on the church board and as, as, as God, as, as, as you're moving through and God is calling you, you you're, you're holding on to something inside you. And it's a little seed of something that turns into, into a deep selfishness and the, and the enemy is, is really building on that. And he's, and he's taking you into the holy city and he's taking you up even higher. And you get to this one high point, this one pinnacle in your career. And then the devil says, validate yourself. Validate yourself. Who do you think you are? All the world is sick. You start to heal them. Because if the Holy Spirit is real, if the book of Acts is real, if the anointing is real, then you ought to be able to do this. You know, why am I picking on that particularly? I'm picking on that because a couple chapters over, we find there's a problem. Chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Jesus addresses this problem. 
And he says this, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, but Lord, hold on a minute. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons, perform many wondrous miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Wait a minute, if somebody's casting out a demon, isn't that a good thing? If somebody's healing the sick, isn't that a good thing? If somebody's doing all this, isn't that a good thing? And Jesus says, well, you know what? I wasn't a part of that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who you are. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. <clears throat> well, isn't it God's will that everybody be healed? Is God so mean that he's not going to heal everybody? No. It's not God's will that everybody be healed. I'm just going to tell you. Because if it was, they would be. If it was, they would be. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again just because it fits here. I don't know how many times people have asked me to pray, sincerely asked me to pray. And I, and I, and I pray with them, and, and they, they, they say, you know, I need you to pray for such and such. And I begin to pray, and the Holy Spirit convicts me about that. He said, that's not the problem. That's the symptom. The problem is this. If, you, if that gets healed now, then this will never be dealt with. So I got to stop right then, which I do. I'll stop right then. And I say, you know what? This is not the problem, the thing that we're, that we're praying about. This is God getting your attention. There's an issue here that God wants to deal with. You see, see we, we tend to short circuit God's plan. Now, why, why would we do that? Don't we want to walk in humility before God? And as we move through life and, and someone who doesn't know about the kingdom, someone who doesn't know about the power that's available to the believer in the kingdom, wouldn't, don't we need to, to walk under God's authority and say, Lord, what's your plan for me today? And as we go through the day and someone comes up to you and says, I need you to pray for this in my life, you, you, you sense out God's will and you say, no, that's not the issue, this is the issue. Doesn't that make sense? That would be what that is. You see, but the devil says, hold on a minute. You prayed for so-and-so and they didn't get healed. I don't think that you have any power. I don't think, as a matter of fact, God even loves you. Right? And then it begins to crumble and crack around you if that's what you think. Because you see, there's a difference between walking under the authority of the Father and walking in the principles of the devil. Now, the devil doesn't mind you walking in some of the principles, you know, as if, even, if it, even if it seems to kind of build a church, as long as you're not walking under the authority of the Father. Because once you start to walk under the authority of the Father, there's a whole lot of stuff in your life that you begin to see and realize. <clears throat> so this is why Jesus said here in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, when he was taken to this very holy religious place and the highest point of this religious place. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. But I, I also know that the commentators would tell us, you know, that this would be the grand entrance of the Messiah. But the devil takes us sometimes to the highest place. And he said, if God really loves you, then you need to then you should. If God really loves you, and, and if it doesn't work out, you know what? I don't think he loves you. I don't, I, don't, I don't think he's done anything in you. But see, that's operating under the principles of the enemy. That's not operating under the authority of God. So Jesus said to him, he, he answered this whole rebuke or this whole temptation with this. And this is, it is look at this, it's curious. Verse seven, it is... Also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Isn't that curious, eh? That's like saying Jesus answering the devil and he says, and he's saying something to the effect of, uh, Lord, if you really love me, I'm going to jump off this tower and you're going to save me. And if you don't save me, well, it ain't going to matter because I'm jumping off a tower, you know. 
Lord, if you really love me, if you really, if you, if you really are doing something in my life, if you're really calling me, then, then we, we suggest something would happen and God should save us. And, and God just really wants to have a relationship with us. You know, he, he just really wants that, that every day we would talk with him. And even more than that, that we would hear what he has to say. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember that? To me, that would be a high place. That would be a great experience to go to a prayer meeting with Jesus. Right? Wouldn't it, Scott? You know what I'm saying? I think that would be great to go to the mountain of prayer with Jesus, to be invited to go, not just to burst in on the situation, but, you know, find yourself all well, here I am all of a sudden, you know, surprise, you know, but, but to be invited. And Jesus would say, you know, uh, Mark, come on, grab two of your friends, and I want you to come to a prayer meeting with me. I want to show you what it's like. And up we go, and there's a conversation. And then all of a sudden, you know, we, we're excited, babbling like, babblers you know and we're you know we're just talking you know like peter he said lord it's great that we should be here we're going to build some temples and we're going to build some shelters and we're going to build a couple of tabernacles and we're just going to spend our time here in the mountains it's going to be wonderful then all of a sudden god interrupts okay settle down boys right that's what he said he said be quiet be quiet this is a prayer meeting be quiet well lord i, I thought in prayer meetings we were supposed to pray yeah but you're supposed to listen too you know, you're asking me all this stuff and I want to tell you something. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to listen to what I have to say in response to what you're saying. Now, <clears throat> we have had these conversations with each other. Joseph, you know what I'm talking about. Now, not you two. I'm not, you know, I mean, your wife always listens to everything you say. <clears throat> well, pretty much. You know what I'm talking about. But, but you ever have a conversation with somebody and, and it's a little bit heated somewhat and they're not listening to what you're saying. You can see it in their eyes. As soon as they stop and you give a response to that because you've been listening, they're thinking about what they're going to say. They're not listening to you. You know what I'm saying. You've been down that road. We don't listen that well. We don't. We, we hear words going by, but we're thinking we know what the problem is and we're just telling the person, you know, our point of it and we're not listening to what they're saying to us. And we do the same thing in the prayer meeting, in our time with God. And God says, be still and know I am God. Be still. That doesn't sound like much of a prayer meeting if we're just still and we're not saying anything. You know, <clears throat> you notice I can always tell when the prayer meeting's over because there's that awkward silence, right? Right? You know, you, you, got, you got people gathered around and, and all of a sudden, you know, you know, someone will say, okay, after the awkward silence, would you pray and close us? Because we don't like the silence. We don't know what that means. We don't know how to, how to, how to concentrate our God. We don't know how to hear God. But... Jesus, this is what I get out of this. He says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, you don't need all of this. What you need is just to walk humbly before your God under his authority. Isn't that something? Can you imagine how your life would change if every day you walked to work, you drove to work knowing you are living today under God's authority. Where he leads you will be where he wants you. Pay attention to your surroundings because you're not walking under your own authority. You're walking under the authority of God. I think that would be life-changing. Do we dare do that then? Yeah, I think we do. I know you guys well enough, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we're crazy enough to take God as word. And I think we need to do it. To walk under his authority. <clears throat> Jesus said, it is written. And with this I'm going to close. It is written. To me, that says, 
live the experience that the word of God points you towards. It is written. Live the experience that the word of God points you towards. See, <clears throat> our experience is tied to the word of God. It's, it's one of the, the basis of our faith, one of the basic anchors of our faith, because in the word of God, we understand what God is saying to us. This, this, this kind of cracks the shell of our, of our dullness. And in there we find, you know, that Jesus saying, you know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, then how do you know what and how do you do what? You see, it cracks the shell of our understanding. So live the experience the word of God directs you towards. Jesus said this to the Pharisees. I think it's in, I don't know where it's at. Matthew, you know, it's in John chapter five. That's where it is. About down to verse about 39, something around that. Uh, it says, um, he talked to the Pharisees. You know the scripture. I've quoted it a dozen times. He says, um, you study the scriptures for in them you think you will find salvation. But you do not know that they point to me. And yet you refuse to come to me. Uh, it says this then. So that you might have life that you might have life. Scriptures point us to Jesus and Jesus brings life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what he says. You know what I've noticed in life? I've noticed in, in my dealings with, uh, with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, uh, in my dealings with the church, my dealings with churches, my dealings with Christians, one irrefutable fact stands out. God does not leave carnage in his wake. Listen to that. God does not leave carnage in his wake. Anytime God enters the scene, there is strength, there's blessing, there's, there's things happen that are, that, are, that are great things. You know, we've been in the presence of God. He doesn't leave ruined lives behind him unless they refuse to come to him. I mean, they, what can he... So why does the church then sometimes? Why do Christians then sometimes? Well, this is a measuring stick, right? We well, can look behind us, you know. Or, are people getting saved? Well, look back here. Your life, your testimony. Your, uh, is your testimony building the church? Is it building the Christian? You know, your testimony back here, or, you know, feeding the hungry, you know. Well, like, what's the stuff that you're leaving behind you from yesterday? Are you operating your life of faith under the principles of the devil or the authority of God? My mother used to say, my mother's a very wise woman. Oh, she, there you are, dear. I didn't know you were here this morning. <clears throat> <laughs> she beats me, you know, when I do this. <clears throat> but my mother used to say, and maybe she still does and I don't pay attention. If you want to know where you're going, look to where you've been. Because your path from yesterday kind of gives you a future view of where you're going to be. If what's behind you is carnage, hurt and pain, problems left, you want to take a close look? Because that's the principles of the devil. If what's behind you is healing, grace, forgiveness, then you know you're walking under the authority of God. Well, that's all I'm going to say about that. But I'm going to leave you with that challenge. Walk humbly before God. Understand his will in every situation of your life, and you will be blessed in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Our Father, this morning, we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity that we have today to know your presence and your goodness and your mercies. Our Father, <clears throat> we recognize that, um, that you're here. 
We've come to meet with you. And Father, these are, these are kind of a little bit of hard words today because um, we don't want to operate under the principles of the enemy. We don't, we don't want the kingdom of darkness to be operating in our church, in our lives, in our families, in our friends. We want to manifest the kingdom of heaven. We want to walk under your authority. We want to submit ourselves to your will. We want to walk in life as you have created us to be. So, Father, help us to be healing agents. Help us to be forgiving agents. Help us to be agents of wholeness and health in life, in the church, in people. Father, help us to, be, to live in such a way that people will say, what's wrong with you? You forgive too much. What's wrong with you? You heal people too much emotionally and spiritually and mentally. What's wrong with you that you can operate like this? What's wrong with you? You give too much. What's wrong with you? You bless too much. My Father, help us to be followers of our Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us, Father, to walk in, in life in light, not death and darkness. Help us, Father, to walk in joy and peace, not fear and uncertainty. Father, this morning, <clears throat> Lord, I, I believe that, I mean, I don't know, but I believe, Father, in my spirit that, that there are some who are listening to these words. Maybe they're here, maybe they're at home, I don't know, but, but Father, there's some who are listening to these words and they need to know, is this for me? And the Father says, yes, these are for you. Come, under the shadow of the Almighty. Make him your refuge and he will be your strength. He gathers you to himself as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings. And he will protect you. He will guide you. For he has plans and purposes for you. To give you hope and a future and an expected end. And so, Father, as we close out our time this morning, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would speak into our hearts individually and privately as, as only you can do. And as we sing this, this last song, Lord, if there's something that we need to set down before you, if there's, if there's something that's been troubling us or whatever it is, Lord, that you just want to set on our hearts, Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name, this would be that day that we start to walk in authority. In the fullness of the Spirit. So guide us, Lord. We're here. Speak, Father, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray.